What I'm going to share with you today is the single fork strategy. I'm going to teach you the single fork strategy. Now, we have some bakers in our class. And whenever I go to formal dinners, you sit down at the white tablecloth spread and they have your place settings. In our home and our dining room, um, all of our place settings are always set. We have the mats, we have the chargers, we have the things on top of the chargers, the plates go on top of the chargers. You have your different silverware in the right places, your glass goes on this particular side. There's a specific order that the forks and the knives and the spoons are supposed to be placed in. There's a specific place for each of the utensils. There's many forks that will be sitting down at, at a table that we may have access to, okay? We may have the smaller fork, which is a salad fork. This is usually the smallest and it's always on the outside, right? That's your salad fork. And then there's usually another fork right inside of that. That's a little bit longer prongs, okay? That is, it's a little bit longer handle and a little longer prongs. And that is your dinner fork. That's what you're eating the main course with, right? And then you may have a, a certain uh, a salad fork, which is yet uh, wider and bigger and only has three tongs, okay? Has three tongs. And then you may even have something greater for some kind of a serving fork. And this is a it's hard to maybe even tell. Let me compare it to the salad fork by comparison. Okay, you can see that different size difference. It's very much, it's much larger. Okay, uh, that may be for some kind of a serving uh, dish that you would use. And there's differences between the two serving forks. Uh, they're about the same size. The one with four prongs is even bigger, but there's uh, four prongs and three prongs. Uh, and so there's many different types of forks. Well, in your business, in each one of your businesses, in each one of your lives, there's many forks. There's many forks. Sometimes we use the proverb uh, that when, uh, when, what do you do when you come to a fork in the road? You're on a path, you're on a trail. And I've been in the Nairobi forest and I've been in some of the trails uh, there and in fact, I got lost in one of the, uh, the, the, the national forests there and ended up taking a road that took several hours uh, for me to make way to get back where, where I was supposed to be. And it's because you get on a path and then you come to a fork in the road and you have to know which one to take. And in each one of your businesses, and in each one of your lives, in each one of your marriages, and in many times in your marriage, and many times with your children, you keep coming, to, and many times in your business, you'll keep coming to forks in the road. You come to a fork in the road, you take one. You come to another fork, you go a direction. You go to another fork, and there's constantly forks in the road that we're having to make decisions about. Most people and most companies when they come to a fork in the road, they take it. <laughs> a lot of people don't choose one way or the other. They start trying to do both and they straddle. And if you keep straddling long enough, all of a sudden you're doing what we call a split and it's very painful uh, for most of us. <laughs> and, uh, and at some point it starts to tear your limbs apart, right? The more of those trails break away from each other. But that's what many of you are doing in your business and in your lives, and it's destroying your, your business. It has been said that there are very few problems in business. Think about this. There's very few problems in business. But there are a lot of emotional problems that are disguised as business problems. There's a lot of emotional problems. I usually tell people, you don't have business problems. You have emotional problems disguised as business problems. You think you have a problem with this employee, you have a problem with how you're handling it. You have a problem with sales, you have a problem with it, you have, a, you have an emotional problem uh, that you're putting on your business. 
And so what I'm going to share with you today is the strategy to have a single focus, the single fork strategy. Pick one. It almost doesn't matter which one. You need to be led of the Holy Spirit, but you need to have a single fork strategy. Pick one. Write this down. The only reason people or companies fail, the only reason people or companies fail is broken focus. It's broken focus. It's not a lack of capital. It's not a shortage of ideas. It is be, it's because of broken focus. If you have the wrong staff, if you have somebody who is an employee who stole from you, if you have things that aren't going right, go back to the single fork strategy. When I became the CEO of the hoverboard company, it was interesting because that nine minute video that I referenced on this topic, the inventor of the hoverboard, which was the single best selling product in the world in 2015, had seen that video. And he reached out to me on Twitter and to offer me the CEO role of his company. And I didn't get it because I don't check social media like that. And I don't have notifications and so forth because I don't want to break my focus, okay? I'm telling you, a lot of the things I teach you, I go to great lengths to make sure that I live. And I do it far more extreme than most people are willing to do. It has been said that if I have more money than you, it's because of one reason. I say no more often than you do. If Warren Buffett has more money than I do, and he does, it's because he says no more often than I do. And the idea behind that is, the idea behind it is that the more times you say no, the more focused you are likely to be. Because you get so focused on what you're supposed to do and what God's called you to do and the purpose of your business and the purpose of your marriage and the purpose of your family, the purpose of your life and existence for him, that you'll find out that most things that people ask you to do, most places people ask you to go, most things that you could busy yourself with are distractions. And we must say with the wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon, all is vanity. It's all vanity. No matter where I go, no matter what I do, no matter what I accumulate, no matter what I acquire, it's all vanity. So the only reason people or companies fail is broken focus. The reason you aren't further along is because of broken focus. There are too many distractions in your life. And I did not say that there's my wickedness. I didn't say that they're wrong. I just said they're distractions. For example, in the United States, they'll say, well, I have to take my children to soccer practice. I have to then go take them to piano practice. And then I have to drive across town to go to this event. And then I have to go to that thing. And then I need to go to this parent teacher conference. Then I need to go meet with the teachers at their school. I'm not saying any of it's wrong. I'm just saying there's a lot of distractions. And then I go to this birthday party and then I go to this wedding and then I go to that. It was hard for me to realize and it took years to realize I don't have to go to everything I'm invited to. And then I realized that my phone, I, I, was, I started seeing all my outside distractions. But then I realized that it's what is distracting my mind. Sometimes it, was, it, it, could, it could be the TV for some people. It can be music for some people where they just kind of get into a lax state. But a lot of times anymore, it's your mobile device. Your mobile device has notifications nonstop 24 hours a day. And even though you put on do not disturb, and even though you put on silent, 
and things along those lines. It still can, is a distraction because you end up getting into the habit of checking the phone to see what notifications you have. So even though it doesn't make a noise or maybe you have it silenced, uh, you still end up checking even if you not uh, have the notifications off. It all is a mental distraction. And those mental distractions are what's keeping you from being able to think clearly enough to come up with the solutions and the ideas and the innovations that God's trying to teach you and tell you that will provide breakthrough for your business and for your marriage and for your family. There's too much noise. Too much noise. We're looking at a lot of things instead of to the one that we're supposed to be looking at. I liked how King David said, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. Psalm 127, from whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. Constantly, our life, every day that I spend with the Lord, during my time with him, I have to keep saying, Lord, I look to you. Lord, I look to you. Lord, I look to you because all I do is go to sleep and I have to get my eyes back on him. If not, you know what we do? We start our days without acknowledging him. You put your feet on the floor and, and before you've even gotten out of bed, you're thinking about what you have to do that day instead of praising him for another day of life. You know, these are the type things that and then and then things happen. Maybe there's an emergency. And uh, look, I know it's, we had our stallion get out last week. And, and, and so that's always, you know, an event if you have to go capture them. Uh, you may have animals break loose, or you may have something with a child, or you may have something go awry, and you have to go handle it first thing, and you wake up to an emergency. I'm telling you, life is about looking back to him, getting your focus back on him, because you have to recognize the danger of broken focus. Now, let me explain the single fork. I obviously explained it to you as when you get to a fork in the road, most people take it. Most people take it. We have a student that uh, I interacted with this past week, um, and uh, his name is Nixon Ambueri. Nixon Ambueri. He has a tree pesticide and a plant pesticide. Okay. Uh, uh, I, and I can't remember if it was in Bahiga, uh, what part, uh, but it's in the country of Kenya. And this pesticide, uh, what, I, what I asked him was, I started giving some different uh, advice and counsel. And then I asked him, are you selling this to consumers or are you selling this to enterprises? Uh, because if you sell it to consumers, then yes, it's good to have it in the bottle where you can just that's already mixed and blended uh, with the right formula so they can just spray it onto their plants or crops. But if they have a hectare uh, or, or a thousand hectares, uh, you're going to want to have something more than a spray bottle, right? That will take a very long time to spray all of your corn stalks uh, up and down for the whole thing. So then you'd need to have it in a sprayer. Well, if you have a sprayer, a commercial sprayer, you're probably going to use a concentrate, a concentrate, not uh, a pre-diluted mix, okay? Because then you can sell massive quantities in smaller containers, which is cheaper for shipping. You can manu cheaper to manufacture and so forth because of weight and because of size and volume. All right. So just from a business perspective, I was asking wh who is your target market with this, so that I best know how to advise you in your business. And that's exactly what I'm trying to teach you with the single fork strategy. Uh, I want to give several examples uh, because I need you to understand that uh, when you try to take multiple forks, you will always go in the wrong direction. I'm going to give you three case studies, okay? And I'm going to do what we call a compare and contrast. Two companies. Number one, uh, the cell phone. Most Everyone has a mobile or cellular device. The, the war between cell phones, when this all started, was between Motorola and Nokia. I don't know if you all remember those names or not from the 80s. 
but Motorola is the one who invented the cell phone. Okay, Motorola invented the cell phone. Nokia quickly caught on to what was happening and built, uh, they actually stopped everything they were doing and selling and started manufacturing nothing but cell phones. And I find it really interesting because Motorola, they took their initial success in cell phones and they went into so many other things. They bought a $13 billion satellite. They were making semiconductors. They were, they were in the paper products business. Uh, they, were, they were selling, uh, well, actually, they, they, so they ended up buying the satellite, going into semiconductors, going to all things electronics after they invented the cell phone. Nokia, on the other hand, was already selling a bunch of other stuff. They were nothing major, just a bunch of different things. They were selling paper products and Nokia was selling shoes and tires uh, and electrical products uh, like uh, toaster ovens, just any household electrical uh, type of product. Uh, so, but when they saw the cell phone, they discontinued selling and manufacturing all of these different items and products to instead focus on the cell phone. They got the single fork strategy. Instead of saying, we're going to sell this and sell this and sell this and sell, they said, we're only going to, we're going to choose a fork. We're going to sell cell phones. Now, obviously, inside of cell phones, they had different models, but they were they employed the single fork strategy. Okay. Motorola invented the cell phone and did the opposite. They said, oh, wow, we got this great product over here. Let's start going doing satellites and let's do semiconductors and let's go into uh, engines and let's do all of this thing, these things over here. Well, let's look at the results. Let's look at the results. Over the last 10 years, Motorola has done $330 billion in revenue and they have a total of $5 billion in profit. Now, let me just... I'm going to take each, take each one of these metrics. Okay, Motorola did 330 billion in revenue. Nokia has done 370 billion in revenue. So Nokia, by focusing on one product, had 40 billion dollars more in sales than Motorola, who invented the cell phone and started selling a bunch of other things as well. The second metric there is Motorola had a profit, had $5 billion in profit. Nokia had $44 billion in profit. That is profound. Motorola's profit margin was 1.6%. 1.6%, very slim profit margin. Whereas Nokia's profit margin was 11.9%, almost 12% over the last 10 years. Here's the big one. And this is one of the questions you have to ask yourself what you're building the company for. But, and that is uh, the market capitalization. That's, that's the valuation. What is the business worth? Motorola, their market cap is 21 billion. And Nokia's market cap is 93 billion. They are worth four times as much as Motorola. Isn't that something? Because they employed the single fork strategy. Second example I want to give you is of the airlines, airlines. So you have the top five major airlines in the world, in the United States specifically, and this is over the past 10 years. Delta, here, here was the top five in the last, uh, uh, the last 10 years, actually 15 years. Uh, Delta, the Delta went bankrupt. US Air, 
went bankrupt. Northwest Airlines went bankrupt. United Airlines went bankrupt. And American Airlines has lost $4 billion before COVID. So four of the five, four of the five top airlines have all, are all bankrupt and have been bankrupt before COVID. And the fifth one lost $4 billion. Not a great track record in business. Like that's not the path that any of us want to emulate. Okay. But then there was another airline called Southwest. Okay. Uh, now you have to understand in the airline business, there's a lot of different forks in the road. Okay. So for example, when you're starting an airline, you, you ask yourself, are we going to be a, go to business destinations or pleasure destinations? So are we a business or pleasure airline? Are we going to serve food or not serve food? Are we going to allow pets or not allow pets? Are we going to fly large planes or regional jets? Are we going to have first class, business class, or coach class? And all of these questions continue. Are we going to be a passenger airline or a cargo airline? And every time most airlines get to a fork in the road, they take it. They say yes and yes. We're going to go to business destinations and pleasure destinations, vacation destinations. They say we're going to have first class, business class, and coach class. We'll have them all. Uh, we'll do passenger and we'll do cargo. Uh, we'll allow pets and, 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 we'll, and we'll allow this and we'll allow that. So every time there's an option, they say yes. Yes to all of it. Yes, we're going to do this. Ironically enough, uh, each of uh, the Delta flies eight different types of planes, eight different types of planes, different sizes for different routes. American Airlines has eight different types of planes. United has six different planes. Well, guess what that means? Because they are a multiple fork strategy instead of a single fork strategy, what happens is just on parts alone, have you ever had to wait for two or three hours or even overnight because the plane you were supposed to take, there was a faulty electrical part and they had to fly one in. And I'm thinking I'm at a major hub. Why am I having to wait for you to fly in a part for your engine? And the reason is simple. Because, because they fly multiple models of airplanes and aircraft, the parts are not interchangeable. You can't take the, the brakes off of one vehicle and put the brakes on a different, on, a, on an SUV. Uh, off of, from the car. You can't take the, the transmission from one and put it in the other. You can't take the tires from one and put it on. The, there's different sizes. They fit differently. So when you have eight different types of aircraft, you have to have eight different sets for every single part that could go wrong. Every single, you can't just, if a seat breaks, I can't just go get a seat for one of my other aircraft. It has to be the identical aircraft, which might be in another city or another country. And so I have to wait based on routes and routes and who's and timing. Every single part you have to have duplicates of and then keep them, have enough of them that they're in easily accessible all around the country. It's very expensive. And it's not smart. It's not wise. It's not kingdom business at all. It's not being a good steward. But that's the way the top five largest airlines are because they say yes instead of going a single fork. Enter Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines, they said they chose to be a single fork strategy, a single fork company. They said, uh, that we're going to, are we going to be business or pleasure? We're going to be business only. Are we going to have first class, business class, or coach class? They said, we're only going to have one class, coach class. Uh, they said, no pets, uh, no meals. Uh, so we don't have to decide if it's a short flight or a long flight, how much food do we serve, how often? They just said none. Uh, no inter, they said no to inter-airline baggage exchange. They said no to corporate discounts. They said no to food. 
They said no to multiple aircrafts. They say they have, they fly one type of aircraft. So whereas the whole industry that is failing miserably is doing a multi, multiple fork strategy, which is expensive and unsustainable, Southwest came over and said, we're going doing the single fork strategy. And when they did, let me explain what the results have been. As, we, as I shared with you, four of the top five largest airlines went bankrupt. At the same time that they went bankrupt, Southwest, several years ago, actually spent $1.4 billion to buy AirTran, which was another popular low-cost uh, airline. And they actually were buying airlines with cash at the time that the other airlines were going bankrupt. Isn't that amazing for you to be on such an upward trajectory while everyone else is tanking? That's why, ladies and gentlemen, when people say, oh, we're in a recession, the economy's bad, things aren't going good, I say, no, you might be in a recession, your economy might be bad, and it might be for most people, but do not say your industry is in a recession. If your industry is, and that's why, and then blame it that that's why you're in a recession. Every time an industry is in a recession, I can always find companies who are flourishing and making millions of dollars in the very same industry that the news media is telling you is in a recession. The reason is simple, because it's the largest companies in that industry that are tanking. And they're trying to put that on the whole industry. No, false. What it means is the industry is changing and these behemoths companies, these Goliath companies are not nimble enough to adjust to the market to make money in this environment. Okay, because they are a multiple fork strategy, not a single fork strategy. I could have detailed Uber in the taxi cab industry. It's not that the taxi transportation business was in a recession. It's that there were new players on the scene who were changing the rules of the game. Same thing with Airbnb. Okay, so let's continue. Southwest has less revenue than the top five by a long shot. Okay, the top five uh, largest airlines have a whole lot more revenue, uh, do a whole lot more revenue than Southwest does. However, the market cap of the top five largest airlines is $10.8 billion combined, okay? So if you add what the companies are worth, even though they do a lot more in revenue, if you add up how much, what each of the companies are worth, the top five largest airlines, their market cap is $10.8 billion combined. And Southwest market cap, before they acquired AirTran, before they acquired AirTran, was $11.2 billion. By having a single fork strategy, they were able to do far less revenue and have a much more valuable company than all of the top five combined. Isn't that amazing? That is what, you know, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They don't know how to build valuable companies. They think it's all about who's doing the most in sales and who's doing the most in revenue without understanding the power of the single fork strategy. Let me give you the third example. The third example I will use is Nintendo and Sony. As you know, they make video game consoles and video game players. Sony, being a much larger company, uh, makes everything, <laughs> right? What doesn't Sony make? Sony is into everything. Nintendo only makes game consoles, only makes gaming game players, video game players. Sony has $83 billion in sales. 
Nintendo only has $8 billion in sales. Think about that. Sony is 10 times bigger than Nintendo in sales. 83 billion in sales versus 8 billion in sales. Sony's market cap, I mean, Sony, what they're worth, what the company is valued at, is $36 billion. Nintendo's market cap is $68 billion. Nintendo makes nearly $80 billion less than Sony, and they're worth twice as much. You say, well, how in the world can that be? Because of the single fork strategy, how you make your revenue, where the margins are. And, the, and if you only have a, one fork to focus on, you're going to have, you're going to make better decisions. You're going to have people in alignment pulling the same way. If I was the CEO of Sony, I can't give all my attention to our washer and dryer division. Because we also have refrigerators and we also have, have airplane engines and we also have uh, cars and we also have audio visual and we're also in electronics and TVs and toasters and, uh, try, and, and, and electric vehicles. And we're trying to get into everything. And so we invariably aren't the best at anything. You're a contender in all of it. But in terms of what is the company worth? What is the company valued at? The market never places a high value on unfocused, distracted companies. It scares the market when you are that distracted. And it scares me even if I was going to invest in, in an entrepreneur, if they are distracted. Why in the world would I ever support a business being funded that is distracted? If I give somebody $100 USD to invest in, in their lawn care business, I want to know they're going to focus on their lawn care business, much less if you give them a large amount. I want to know that that's what they're focused on. I don't want them to go start this other business and this other business. And next week they have another idea and they start that. And the next week they have yet another idea and they start that and another product and another service. Forget that. They're so distracted. They can't take care of their initial customers. They get in a hurry. They don't do a good job. And then they start attrition. They start losing customers because when you first started as my baker, you made very good things, but your quality has gotten worse. Why? Because you got more customers, because you got in a hurry, because you were trying to grow, because you were having to take care of other things. Whatever the reason, you ended up adding multiple forks because what happened is you needed more revenue. So instead of getting better at your single fork, the easier path, the path of least resistance for entrepreneurs, for all of us, myself included, is to add another fork. Because and sometimes, sometimes even our customers will say it. Sometimes even our customers will say, uh, hey, I really love what you do. Would you do this for me? Can you start making that? And so we say, okay, because we need a little bit more revenue. So we add another fork. Now we're in this business over here too. And then, we, then somehow over time, we end up with another fork. We're in, we're in yet another business. And then we add yet another one and we're in another business. And before you know it, we're stretched thin, we're distracted because we said yes. We got to a fork in the road and we said yes instead of no. We took it because we needed some capital, because we were in a pinch, in a bind. But at some point, when you take different paths, different forks, it's, you're going to spread too thin and it does not work. There's not a case study where it works. That is why governments have what they call antitrust cases. That's why the European Union breaks up Google, why they break up Apple, why, they, why Apple intentionally does not go into certain things where it could. Apple never got into making cell phone covers and screen protectors in what we call the cottage industry around cellular devices 
and smartphones because they want to intentionally avoid having a complete monopoly on the market. Even though you have uh, the Android uh, platform and system, you, there is one altern major alternative to an Apple product, but it's very hard when you have a superior product to not dominate in the world. And so they had to intentionally say no, even though they could have had a lot more revenue, but then they would fall, the uh, draw the ire of regulators and governing agencies and bodies around the world. And you know what? You still do. Because if you're that good at a single fork strategy, you're going to become the biggest and the best in the world. And then you actually have to figure out how to split off parts of your business, how to not add different things just because you could and you could win at it, you actually have to start thinking the opposite. Wouldn't you like to have that problem? It's a different way of thinking, see. But you get there by having a single fork strategy. So let me talk about what the results are. I just, well, actually I shared that Sony's market cap was 36 billion. Nintendo's is 68 billion. And so even though Nintendo makes $80 billion less than Sony, they are worth twice as much. So, and what you find every time is with the single fork strategy, it takes less time, it takes less effort, your employees are happier, your customers are happier because they're getting the att attention and the focus. And so you are able to do a better job and provide better quality to them. That is the single fork strategy. What I want to do now is to open it up for questions and uh, specifically about each of your businesses. And let's talk about, are you focused? Is it considered a single fork strategy? And how do you grow uh, if you want to remain a single fork strategy? Uh, and so as you raise your hands, I'll know who to call on. I, I, I'll continue along some, some additional thoughts in the meantime. Uh, first, when you have um, a business and you're needing to create more revenue, it's, it is easier to come out with another product. What you, but what it needs to be is a complementary product. It doesn't need to be one where you have to buy entirely new equipment, new manufacturing, new packaging material. Uh, if there's a way to, like for example, when, when uh, a potato chip manufacturer, okay, potato chips, when they come out with a new flavor of chips, they did not come out with an entirely new product. It's still the same packaging, the same size. Um, it's a different label, a different name. And all they do is come out with a different flavor. Sometimes w flavored water, they'll do the same thing. So it's the same equipment, the same, but they are able to get what, uh, incremental sales and revenue without incurring additional expense, okay, for that. Very little additional expense, and it makes it worth it. They're not going into entirely different markets, uh, which in that case, they're still single fork, okay? Southwest did not only fly to one destination and back and try to say, okay, I'm focused, it's just a single fork. That's You have to understand where the fork decisions come into play in your business, uh, or else you can limit your market so much that the problem is not that you're focused. The problem is that you're so overly focused that there is not market share to be had, okay? If I wanted to start some weird business, that's fine, but there may be only be three people in the world who want the product or service. So I may capture 100% of the market and still be broke, okay? And as focused as I am, I'll never succeed because the market share was not big enough for us to succeed, okay? And that's important to understand. Any market you go into, even in your uh, one pagers at the, the week one, month one, week one, uh, with all of the resources for the for Roland College, uh, the Kingdom School of Business and the Christian School of Entrepreneurship, for every single one of those, uh, it has on there, what is the market cap? What, or excuse me, what's the market share uh, that you're trying to attain and wh how, how, what size is the market? That you're in okay if you're selling avocados great how big is the market you're in and i don't mean the global market um i mean maybe the market you're going to play in 
how much of the global market do you expect to be able to capture with your strategy? No matter what your industry is, I would like for you to be able to say what percentage of market share you have of it. Now, I think many of you may not, it might be such a small amount that you can't even calculate it. It might be one, one millionth of a percent, right? Based on the global market of whatever business you're in. And I want you to think differently. I want you to think about that as your bread and butter and that's what pays the bills and put food on the table. But I want you to think bigger than that. I want you to think differently than that. I want you to tar start thinking about the business that you create and that you grow that where you are become the best in the world, number one or number two in the world at what you do. And it's not because of capital. Like I said, the only reason people fail is broken focus. It all comes down to the single fork strategy. And isn't it interesting that Motorola creates the cell phone and then goes into all these different things. By the way, several years ago, Motorola finally sold off their satellite. They spun off the semiconductors. They dropped some of the electronics and they started to try to get refocused. But this is after they've lost billions of dollars and they already lost the cell phone war. The very thing they invented, the cell phone, they've lost it now. Done. Okay, so those are the things to consider with the single fork strategy. At this time, I, yes, I want to welcome Ms. Pamela Abui, and we will. Greetings, Caribou. Good evening, sir. Greetings. Yeah, thank you for the lessons you just had. And uh, I only have one question to ask you, or rather an advice. Uh, my business, as you are aware, services, whereby I use a lot of uh, stationaries uh, to do my work. Now, uh, according to the topic you have just taught us, you have taught us about the single fork uh, strategy and the multiple strategy, which is not good. I was thinking of venturing or rather starting a, a book, a, a stationary shop, which will uh, be selling, I'll be selling stationary, and at the same time, I'll be using it in considered as a single strategy or it is a multiple strategy business. Thank you. Thank you, Asante Sana. I, I think um, if I understand correctly, a stationary shop, you'd have many different types of stationaries for whatever consumers chose. Uh, but you're still focused in the sense that it is the same genre. It is the same uh, category of stationary. Uh, so I think that you were able to do that and still be uh, have, have a single fork strategy. What you want to make sure is what does that mean in the stationary business? So, for example, let's brainstorm this momentarily. Uh, does that mean that you only have one type of stationary? No, but it also doesn't mean that you have every type of stationary possible, perhaps. Um, what you will find is that 80% of your customers will use the same three or four types of stationary. So you may have more of those three or four types and then a few sampling of the others that you buy on demand uh, just as needed. Uh, that is possible. Have a catalog of all the things or sample. Uh, you know, one of the things they do in our stationary shops and the printing shops uh, is there's a binder, a, a catalog uh, where you can feel the different types of paper, the texture, the thickness, uh, and maybe the pattern uh, that's on it and choose for that for whatever you're wanting to do. But most of them don't keep it in stock. Uh, you have to get it separately uh, because it's just such a rare occasion that people use some of that stationery. So I would stock the, find out what the market wants. Uh, but I would also extend, uh, find a way to extend beyond your local stationery shop. 
How do you become, and this is the question to ponder uh, this week, how can you become the main stationary brand in all of East Africa? What would it take? What makes your, what could make your brand the brand, the main brand? Do you know, uh, a lot of people will use tissue to like uh, our nose or sneeze or something, you know, and we'll say, may I have a tissue? Uh, in the U US, a lot of people say, may I have a Kleenex? And Kleenex is actually not an issue. Kleenex was a company. That was the brand. But it became the main brand that people used for a tissue that we actually stopped saying, would you, may you give, would you give me a tissue to, can I have, may I have a Kleenex? <laughs> the brand became the product, synonymous with the product. Uh, we do that with several things. Uh, uh, may I have a Coke? Uh, usually in the United States, when people say that, they don't mean, can I have a Coca-Cola? They mean they want some kind of soda pop, uh, some mm -hmm. kind of a beverage like that. Not necessarily a Coke. I just, oh, can I have a Coke? Um, there are other products uh, that they became so successful as, as a brand that it became synonymous for the, for the product even though other companies entered it. And so mm -hmm. stationary is a wide open market uh, that you need to decide what the single fork is going to look like for you. And quite frankly, it may be that you sell stationary online, you sell it in shop, but it also may mean that you wholesale the stationary out to other print shops and other uh, vendors uh, that are complementary vendors, internet cafes and so forth. Uh, so wholesale it so that you have the wholesale side uh, because it, you may find that you make more money with less hassle uh, selling to companies uh, wholesale than you do selling to consumers at all because you'll have be selling in bulk. Um, and that all depends on how you get it. And if you can get it at a good price point and then resell it. Uh, but I believe that there is great room. If I was counseling you on how to become the number one or number two in all of East Africa, and if you can become one or two in all of East Africa, you can become number one or number two in all of Africa. Thank and, you. Yes. And so I would like to see that happen. Uh, there, I'm trying to think there's, there was one uh, 20 years ago in the United States and uh their day timers, their planners, uh, were became the best, and it was because of the brand. Even though there were many types of planners and day timers, there was only mm -hmm. one of this brand. The quality was a little bit better. It was more uh, clearly uh, lined up, and um, a lot of the others were just kind of a cheaper version of it. Uh, but there was only one. So you might be able to, you could become the source. Uh, and, and I would like to see that happen. But you, that means you'd have to have an online presence as well as an offline presence where people are able to buy it. Uh, it also means you might end up selling through one of the other platforms. If you had it listed for sale, if you can find a way to ship it cheaply, uh, you could uh, even list it in Amazon, have an Amazon store or a Shopify store. Uh, and then you're selling to people all over the world. Uh, and mm -hmm. if it was some type of uh, uh, even African stationery, imagine if I was able to write a thank you note, not on something I went and bought at Walmart or Target, uh, big, big box stores here in the United States, but I was right, mm -hmm. able to write it on parchment stationery from Africa. Do you think that mm -hmm. the person I wrote the letter to, it would mean more? Absolutely. But you, yeah. it would be up to you and to your brand to sell that story. You have to tell mm -hmm. that story just like I told it to you. It would make a difference mm -hmm. because people feel that. And so that's part of why we did the video uh, mm -hmm. uh, projects was so that people would get comfortable telling the story uh, and making it special. So thank you so much, uh, Madam. Every blessing to you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next question. 
uh, let us go to uh, uh, Mr. Amos Akadiva. Caribou, sir, we'll get you, bring you in for you to unmute. Uh, we do not have sound. Uh, we still do not have sound for you. Uh, let's see. We still do not have sound. We'll give it a moment. Might be a network problem. Uh, we can see you. I want to hear your question. <laughs> I can't. Uh, we just can't hear. Uh, let Perhaps uh, we'll keep waiting for you to try to unmute. Uh, so be on standby. I want you to keep working on your sound so that you can unmute uh, and we'll keep an eye on that. And we will go to, uh, oh, actually, I see that you just successfully did it. So let's bring you back in. No, you, you, can, you can get me. Thank you. I'm Amos Akidiva. I work um, in Banja Market, Viga County. And I, uh, I'm happy with your teachings. Uh, now I don't understand, I don't really understand how this works because if I'm selling, um, let us say avocados, do you mean for me to, to practice this single fork uh, 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 strategy, I cannot sell bananas and also I cannot sell mangoes. I just deal with the avocados only. I cannot sell other fruits. That's a great question and I appreciate the question. And the answer is, it depends. It depends. I can tell you, based on what you said, the fact that you're selling it in a specific market, I can tell you that, no, it's not a distraction for you to sell bananas, mangoes, and avocados, because you are in one market, in one kiosk, in one shop. Okay? That's fine. Now, if you started selling bicycles and wheelbarrows and, uh, you know, other things like that and ladders, yeah. that would be a distraction. That's not single focus anymore single fork strategy. However, but I do want to take the illustration that you that you gave because when would what you're doing now become a multiple fork strategy? If you were going, if your business was, you said, instead of saying, I'm going to try and sell the most that I can in this spot. See, you can only sell so much from one, from one store in one spot. There is a maximum because there's only so many customers who come there. There's only so much resources that comes into the market. There's only so much capacity. Market share, there's, you can measure that. There's only so much, okay? Yeah. So then your options as a businessman is to either do I open a second location, like do I go into another market and then have somebody oversee it, but what happens if they give some away or if they don't sell it and they're lazy or they take it or... You know, you have to manage this. Uh, and even then, in that second location, there's only so much market share wherever you expand to. Okay. So you can keep doing that to grow. Uh, and that is one way to do it. But if you were going to try to become a, uh, an, a, an international shipper or wholesaler of avocados, then that would be a distraction. That's not a single fork. Can you imagine if any of the major avocado dealers in the world also sold mangoes and bananas and things like that? They don't. Most yeah, of them, yeah. they, the big ones, they specialize in avocados. But here's what I also want you to understand. They are the ones focused on business to business. They are selling wholesale to stores and to distributors that then sell to people like grocery stores or markets that sell a bunch of fruit. And you're the one at the end of that chain selling multiple fruits because the margins are too small to just sell avocados. You have to sell others in order to get customers and make enough money. But the people at this end of the chain can uh, focus with a single fork strategy. Okay. The, here's the trick. The more, the more you focus on, they divide your focus down here. You never get out of this hamster wheel. You'll constantly be on this little merry-go-round making a pittance because, and you'll never be up here 
making all the money because with a single fork strategy. And you ever wonder why people have all this time to be on the golf course and all this time to be on their boat and their luxury yachts and traveling the world and shopping with their family and having long dinners out to eat uh, and all these things. And, and, and then they have a big business. And then you've got people over here working themselves to death and hardly having two nickels to scrape together to buy a loaf of bread. It's because they have a single fork strategy and most of these people don't. Now, yeah. and it's only because of which area you choose to build your business in. What part of the, of the business strategy and ecosystem, where in that cycle you choose to build your business. If you're manufacturing or if you're in the middle of distributing or if you're at the end of what we call retailing. Because you know the hierarchy of that. There's the the people who grow it and manufacture it, there's the people, uh, the distributor, the wholesalers, the distributors, uh, and then there's the retailers selling it directly. Now, you might be able to grow it yourself and cut out the middleman. 80% of the money, 80% of the markup in all product sales is the middleman. It's the distribution of it. The wholesaling and distribution takes up 80% of most any products. So if a product costs one dollar, eighty cents of it is probably distribution and middleman markup. If you're if it's an automobile, eighty percent of it is not the cost of the car; it's to be able to ship it and to, for it to be able to sit on someone's lot long enough for you to be, someone to end up going and buy it. It's like all that rent each month and each week that it sits there. Um, so when you can cut out the middleman and go direct to the consumer. Uh, you can pass along some savings that way. Uh, and if you can't, then you really need to reevaluate the business model. So I just wanted to give you a couple of different examples how what you're doing uh, would be considered single fork because you're just selling fruits or you would be selling fruits at the, at the marketplace, okay, from your, yeah. from your standard kiosk. If you started selling other type products, then you're getting distracted and unfocused. But if I was if I was you and I was asking myself, how can I earn more money? How can I generate more revenue? How can I how can I add more value to society? Then I would be asking myself, not how do I sell more fruits at my stand? Because that has a limited market share. I would say I need to expand my market share. So I need to find a way to sell my products to a larger audience. Maybe that's through opening up other places, other kiosks and at other markets, or it might be that I need to get even more focused, choose one particular uh, uh, plant or vegetable or fruit, and I need to go on this end of the spectrum, and I need to start at the beginning, and or maybe not at the beginning, but maybe a little bit in, because even the farmers anymore are getting squeezed out, and it's the ones who can harvest uh, and accumulate. So, for example, and I've seen this many times in Africa, where the ones that are doing very well financially, what they do is they contract maybe uh, 500 farmers who grow avocados. And they say, we will purchase all of the avocados you can grow at this price. Done, okay? We'll buy every single avocado you have at this price. When you do that, now they know, okay, I'm going to have 300,000 avocados. So then they go to one of the international shippers and dealers and say, I can sell you 300,000 every six months, 300,000 avocados every six months at X price, which is includes your markup. Okay. And then that's yeah. literally what a single fork strategy would be. Then you're sitting around not saying, what else can I do or how much, uh, what other fruit do I add? You're going to sit around and say, uh, how do I get more farmers? How do I get that farmer to stop selling to the other group and start selling to me? What if I give every single one of my farmers uh, uh, free education for one of their children to primary school? What if I give every single one of them a free tuition to roll in college? What if I give every one of them uh, a $1,000 USD bonus every year if they reach certain uh, quantities for me with certain quality that I put in place? What are some incentive programs I can put in place? What are some benefits that I can give to my give to my growers and farmers? You're going to start thinking like that, and then the, all of the international uh, uh, food processors are going to start recognizing your business as, hey, 
if you want good quality that doesn't get rejected by the end retailer, the chains, buy it from them because they have the best. So then they're going to say, I need you to produce more and more and more. So you've got to keep working that out. And that's when the business starts really growing and you're only focused on one thing. Uh, and that's avocados. You're not running around and doing all of these different things. You're able to be focused. Thank you so much, Amos. I hope that was helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. All right. Uh, let us go to uh, Gerald Camilla. Greetings, sir, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, your Excellency, I'm so happy again today to be part of this class. And uh, today's topic is uh, one of those topics that uh, had uh, reminded me something. Uh, that uh, when I was developing uh, the app that I had mentioned in this class earlier on, uh, I was actually planning to have it uh, serve the three transport, like uh, be a solution to the three transport uh, uh, sectors, uh, which is courier, kahaya, and taxi. Uh, now, I don't know if you can uh, uh, allow me to just share my screen. I show you uh, I, the app that I had started uh, developing. Oh, it uh, won't uh, it show because uh, it, oh, it is won't. blocked. But yes, go ahead and, and, and just kind of give us the overview here. Yeah, yeah. so uh, it was in a sense that uh, it had uh, three uh, profiles. The first uh, page profile, which was now for courier, when you open, you log in, you, 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 you first uh, uh, meet the courier profile, where you can be able to request for any kind of uh, transportation within the courier uh, page. And then the second page now had the car hire, when you see that these are tabs. So when you click on the car hire, it takes you to the car hire uh, profile where uh, there are cars there, uh, the, the, uh, the people subscribed to the app will have uh, uh, uploaded the, the, their cars on the app and uh, they are able to request uh, for a, a, a car hire uh, uh, on the app. And then now when you click on the third uh, uh, tab, which is now for the uh, taxi or cab, now you are able to request for whichever uh, uh, taxi that you want, be it uh, a motorcycle uh, to a small saloon car or to maybe even up to a minibus. Uh, so I don't know if uh, by so doing, if it was a kind of a, a creating a distraction or, or uh, I don't know if I was uh, in the right track, maybe you could advise me on that. Uh, I love it. I love it. Um... You know what I was thinking about as you were speaking uh, and explaining this, uh, th the companies that are winning globally right now, uh, they actually, you have the right ideas, but it was a multi-fork strategy. The ones who are winning did it single fork strategy. Uber, Uber successfully competed with Didi in China. Like Uber was it in China. And then of course, China always likes to start their own version of stuff and, and so that they can own it. But, uh, and they started Didi but, uh, and squeezed Uber out. But uh, Uber is still the best in the world at transportation, no matter where you go. Uh, and it's uh, with, with private car. Now they don't, uh, they just announced today, actually, some expansion things uh, that they're doing, but they've been single port for over a decade. And so it's, it's, it, what they're doing is actually a good thing in the direction they're going. But the problem is most people try and start companies where Uber's headed, not even where they've been. And even then, they're not trying to be all of these things. And Uber has tried. Uber has tried. So, for example, and once again, I, I can't defend the logic of it because it makes total sense to do it the way all of these companies do it. I'm just telling you the result doesn't work. That, that the only reason people and companies fail is with the focus. So for example, let me see, uh, we're getting a little feedback, uh, but, but uh, Uber, for example, came out with Uber Eats, okay? 
Uber tried to do, before they came out with Uber Eats, they tried to do Uber delivery, which was, uh, look, maybe you don't have a, uh, it, which was essentially a courier business. So instead of using the United States postal system and, or UPS or DHL to ship a package, and they were trying to get uh, attract truck drivers because we use a lot of 18 wheelers in the United States to transport large amounts of things. And so by instead, so they tried to attract truck drivers to enroll in their program and saying, look, you already have all the stuff in the back. Why not take one or two packages up in the front? Uh, and you're going to make personally, you know, whatever it is, so you end up making a few hundred bucks uh, a week. Just having a couple boxes in there doesn't take you off your route at all. It's a no brainer. Actually, you're already shipping cargo. Makes total sense. It was a flop. It was a fail, even though it was logical. Uber Eats, very logical. But here's what's funny. People preferred to get their food delivered by uh, DoorDash and by some of the others who only focused on food delivery, not also on people delivery or food delivery. So they wanted, they wanted people who do food delivery to do food delivery. They wanted, uh, the Americans wanted people who do people transport to do people transport. If you were in the taxi business, that's different than if you were in the private car business. And so they started doing, so you, Uber was only private car. They didn't also have taxis um, and then vice versa. Um, and, and, and even now, even in their expansion, they're doing it in a very controlled manner so that they don't cross some of those lines. But even then it may not work. It may not work to segment it up any more uh, than what they're doing. So whenever you give the example of, uh, of the courier and of the private uh, car, and then also of taxi and public transportation uh, or, or a Matata or something like that, uh, you know, uh, I'm not saying it won't work because it's very logical that it would, but here's the problem. Those are three different customers. That's why it usually doesn't work. It's three different, com completely different markets. We think of it as, oh, it's transportation. But you've got to think about it from the end consumer's perspective that it's three different consumer markets. The people who are doing the courier service are not the same people who are looking for, uh, you know, the public transportation. The people who are doing the private transportation is different than both of those other two segments. So they're going to only go to the company that serves that need. In our minds as business owners and entrepreneurs, that makes us a one-stop shop. It's logical to be have an app like that. It's just that it's user adoption is where the execution usually fails with that kind of an idea. So there's a lot of things that are technically possible. Uh, it's just that it doesn't work. So for example, let me, let me give you another something to ponder. Uh, I love how you think uh, about these things. So McDonald's, obviously, you know, very one of the largest fast food restaurants in the world. Subway, one of the largest fast food restaurants in the world. Uh, Taco Bell or KFC, one of the, you know, some of the largest uh, young brands anyway that owns Taco Bell and KFC uh, in Long John Silvers, one of the largest companies in the world in fast food industry. Okay, well, does McDonald's have enough money to start serving Mexican food and compete with Taco Bell? Yes. So why don't they? Well, I don't, they start serving fried chicken uh, and, and, and uh, beat Chick-fil-A and KFC. Or why doesn't KFC start selling uh, more hamburgers uh, and compete with McDonald's? It's because they're different customers. It, it's, it's, um, you'll find that they don't cross. They understand their, their market uh, in a very unique way. Uh, and usually the reason people are, are not focused, and it's why I opened up today's class with this, was most companies don't know who they are or who their market is. If they did, it would change. It would be a lot easier to have a single fork strategy. The problem is it takes a lot of money to grow in one target market. But imagine whenever you have three different target markets, three different customer segments and customer markets, and you've got to, you've got to go into all of them, you're not going to win. You know, there's not enough money to penetrate any one of those three. Uh, so you're better off focusing all of your resources on one particular category and doing it amazing. Build everything around that customer segment's experience. 
to give them the very best experience in that. Have incentive programs. Have the more times you ride with our private drivers, or, or whether it's a motorcycle or a private car, you're going to earn, you know, little tabs or check marks or trophies. And then whenever you get uh, 25 of the little trophies, you get to redeem that for one free ride or, you know, something. But you have this, or you attain to this level, and we give you this title. And then you attain to this level. And now you're one of our super riders. And super riders get to be five minutes late without the driver driving off. Uh, or, you know, all the different perks, but you end up creating an entire program and ecosystem to serve one target market. So what you have right there is three companies in one. You have, you're trying to do Uber, DHL, uh, you know, and, uh, and public transportation in an app, uh, which shows the problem is not technological because it can easily be done. The problem is the way consumers buy the way consumers consume uh, is illogical. Even though what you're doing is logical, people do not, how people buy is emotional, not logical. So thank you very much for sharing. I hope that was beneficial. I love the great questions because it can pull additional uh, knowledge that I can share that obviously the Lord had for us today. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Blessings to you. Okay. And we have one last question uh, uh, from Madam uh, Cynthia. Adisa, let me kindly welcome you. <laughs> Share. Okay, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I don't have a question today. For me, it's just a, a word of appreciation. Mm. For I have learned a lot of things about single fox strategy. At least I've gained something from it. Mine is just thank you for the lesson. Thank you very much. Asante. Uh, Asante, Sana, Karibu, uh, Rava. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I that me, that's means a lot. Your kind words uh, of appreciation. Yes. You are most welcome. Yeah. I thank God for thank for you. you and for all of the Roland College students. We pray for you uh, almost daily uh, and every time that I see all the different names, um, I, I call them out even by name uh, as much as I can. But we pray, pray for our students every day. And we thank God for you. Uh, this is so important to me and to all of us because it is this thinking that will break down strongholds on the continent of Africa to free God's people economically. Uh, and yes, that only goes so far. Yes, it's more important that you're right with God and that you have a clean conscience before your creator. Uh, and yes, you should walk with him. Because righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a folly to any people, is a reproach on any people. Uh, you, so you must walk with him. And he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. So no matter how smart you are in business, you cover your sins, you're going to fail. All of these are biblical principles that stand and have stood the test of human history and of all time. But there's also information. There's knowledge of the world which I just think is information, it's noise. And then there's knowledge of the holy. There's these extra nuances that God gives us that helps us understand, look, if we can get focused, just like he told us to keep our eyes on him and we have to fight off the distractions of life to keep our eyes on him, you and I have to bat off all of the distractions in our business and keep our eyes focused on the single fork and we can look and live as well and thrive. Isn't that, isn't the Bible amazing? How the principles, you can apply them to our lives today. A, a God's word that was written by for over 40 authors over a span of 1400 years, that it is so relevant, no contradictions, the inerrant, inspired, infallible word of God that teaches us how to be good husbands, how to be good wives, spouses, uh, fathers, mothers, business people. It's absolutely amazing. And we praise God for it. Uh, okay. Last question. I see we have uh, Mr. Nixon Ambuari. Let me add you to the conversation, sir. Caribou, you're on. Mr. Nixon Ambuari. Hello. Greetings. Hello. 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 Greetings. Hello. Greetings. 
Hello. <laughs> I think he may be having some Hello. challenges, audio challenges. Hello. Yes. Hello. Okay. He's definitely having audio challenges. Uh, perhaps one of the class facilitators will be able to get with him and get his question. Uh, actually, uh, he is the one who had the tree pesticide that I uh, uh, initially gave the illustration about. So uh, I certainly look forward to, to hearing from here, uh, from him. Let me bring in Abigail Imenza. Uh, welcome, welcome, madam. I think maybe your video has froze. Okay, maybe while her network is uh, is coming back, I want to also give appreciation and thanks to the uh, comments that give greetings to uh, the First Lady and to my family. We are very appreciative of that. We are really looking forward to being with you in July for graduation. Uh, and details will be forthcoming about that in the coming weeks. Uh, but uh, so stay tuned to your, the leadership on the ground there and uh, about what graduation will look like and be like. We are going to have a lot of people. And uh, so uh, we, we expect to have over a thousand graduates. Uh, I, the Lord has also been doing a work in my life, uh, in my heart, uh, about the word that I'm going to share with you at that time. And I really believe that it is a word in a, uh, that he's given me for this year and perhaps from here on uh, as a, as a uh, defining moment uh, in, in, in our lives and in, in, in history, uh, certainly it can be. Uh, and so uh, I'm really looking forward to the charge and the send off uh, as you graduate. Uh, let me try one more time to bring in uh, uh, Nixon uh, and Wary, and then we will close in prayer. Nixon, are you able to hear us? Hello. Hello. Greetings. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Thank you. Um, Nixon. Hello. Yes, greetings. Continue. Um, Nixon asked I'm Wary, and I wanted to ask, I am a farmer. And yet I want butchery. So my intention was to have almost around, uh, because in Kenya we have got uh, 47 counties. Eh? So I wanted to open in, into around 24 counties, more than butcheries. Can I manage? Yes, absolutely. You can be in 24 of the 47 counties. Uh, you yes. can manage that. Uh, I can tell you that the question that you need to uh, really think through is what business model, what is your structure going to be to accomplish that? Okay. What is the method of distribution? What is the, how are you going to accomplish that? Uh, because there's going to be the smart way and then there's going to be all the other ways. <laughs> There's, there's not going to be multiple right ways of doing it. Uh, there's going to be multiple ways of doing it, most of which will make you go broke uh, and make you work yourself to death and make you wish you had never done it. Um, so there's going to be a right way of doing it. Uh, and you're going to have to figure out what that business structure is. It could be uh, where you have affiliates uh, in each of the different counties. And you say, uh, I want you to be a reseller of these cherries, uh, of, of our brand of cherries. Uh, I want you to be an affiliate. I want you to be a reseller. And then you work out if they have to buy certain quantities up front uh, at a discount, and then they resell it and keep the profit, whatever they can sell them for uh, is fine. And then you keep supplying them. And then that way your brand, you are in 24 counties. Uh, at that point, you might as well be in all 47 counties. Uh, and at that point, you might as well start trying to get affiliates 
uh, in Uganda and Rwanda and Zimbabwe and Ghana uh, and Nigeria and Ethiopia and other countries as well, right? Because then if you've got the best charities uh, and if you can supply them, then, then you do that. You start to decide, uh, hey, our cherries may be a delicacy in some of these other places. And certainly if you brand them properly, you can make them such, even if they aren't. I remember uh, one of the most popular fishes in the U.S., and you have it in Kenya as well, is tilapia. Well, uh, tilapia was actually, is actually a bottom feeder fish that used to be called a very gross name, a very gross name. And no one, so the fishing market globally, nobody ever could sell that fish, but it was so easy to catch. And so the fish market, literally the fish, so whatever the National Fish Association or whatever, uh, they ended up renaming the fish to tilapia. So it had a, a better sound to it, a nicer ring to it. And now they can charge a bunch of money for this bottom feeding, nasty named fish. But because it sounds better, even though it eats all the garbage of, the, of wherever it's growing, it eats, it eats the garbage on the bottom of, of the ocean. I mean, it's just disgusting. But the reason we all eat it is because it has a nice name, started being sold in the nice restaurants, and presented like it's this great fish. Well, you don't know. And everyone's ordering tilapia. And I, I, I still laugh whenever some, you know, 20-something waitress comes up and says, our special of the day is tilapia. It's $24.95. And I'm thinking to myself, I wouldn't pay $2.95 for your bottom feeding fish. You're trying to sell it to me like it's, it's like it's some rare prestigious fish, you know? And, uh, but, but my point is, that's marketing. I'd like to see you do the same thing with your cherries. Why are your cherries better than everybody else's cherries? What makes them different? There are certain brands of cherries in the United States that control the market. They have probably... 60 or 70% market share. And it's not because nobody else can make a good chocolate covered cherry. It's because that brand, because of the brand. Think about Godiva chocolate. Everyone's heard of Godiva chocolate. Okay, that brand of, of, of chocolate, Godiva. Uh, there, but there's Hershey chocolate. There's a bunch of other chocolate. But if you want nice chocolate, you get Godiva chocolate. And, and people just know that. The same thing with your cherries. It's not enough just for you to have certain things. And maybe it's because you grow it a certain way. Uh, I remember whenever I was CEO of one company, the man who owned the company owned multiple companies. He only had a 20,000 acre shrimp farm in Belize, the country of Belize. And I went down there for a week to look at the shrimp farm. And there were six football fields, like bigger than soccer fields, football field size uh, waterways filled with different types of shrimp. And, uh, and then they'd sell them to restaurants and shrimp main, uh, distributors around the world, mainly to Mexico and U.S. And uh, they'd sell all different sizes of shrimps uh, based on if it was going on a salad or if it was a big prawn that was going in an expensive restaurant or what have you. So this shrimp manufacturer, but the, the, the idea uh, uh, was that they then became known, uh, their shrimp was superior to other shrimp, but the beauty was he actually also grew mahogany trees around the shrimp farm. And he started getting uh, about 30 to 40% more money, faster growth, of the mahogany trees because when he had the shrimp shelled which some people wanted it shelled some people wanted it unshelled so he unshelled he would pay people to unshell it and then what do you do when you have all of these shrimp tails it stinks uh and it it takes up the size of a warehouse but he started putting it uh, those shrimp tails around the mahogany trees as fertilizer instead of using horse manure and cow manure he used the shrimp tails as biodegradable, and his trees ended up growing 30% faster than the mahogany trees that did not have that, that had the other fertilizer. So his one business 
he ended up finding what would have been trash and he would have had to pay somebody to haul off by using it properly in another part of his farm, ended up causing it to grow faster, better, stronger, so he could make more money faster. Well, all of his mahogany competitors can't afford to buy uh, shrimp tails and try to start using that. The, that was a strategic advantage that he had uh, you know, by doing that. So that is, that, uh, is what I would say on, on as you grow, Think about how to do it wisely. Your business structure is going to be the key to success or failure or will be the failure. Uh, how you grow is going to be everything to see if it's going to be sustainable or not. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mbwari, for, uh, for your question. I trust that that was uh, a value to you. Well, Roland College, it has been a delight to be with you yet another week. And we thank God for it. Uh, I thank God for the single fork strategy. I think it's biblical. And, and uh, I know in our lives, that's the answer is to have a single focus. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And in business, that is your answer to success as well. Uh, and so may we just keep our eyes on him. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Uh, and then you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water uh, that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. His leaves also shall not wither. It means you're not going to, you won't make it and lose it, make it and lose it. Your leaf will not wither and whatsoever you do will prosper. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the single fork strategy.